As always, the opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of DKI APCSS, the U.S. Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Oftentimes, fishers, migrant laborers, are lured into the promise of decent wages and stable work only to find themselves in this nightmarish reality of forced labor and abuse. From the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Honolulu, Hawaii, welcome to Episode 9 of the Security Nexus webinar, Fishing for Security from Sea Slavery, featuring this Annie Barlow, a seasoned maritime security expert who has dedicated her life to unraveling the intricacies of this issue. I'm your host, James Minnick, Colonel United States Army, retired and professor at DKI APCSS. And today is February 26th. Imagine a vast and vibrant ecosystem teeming with life. Now imagine the same scene, shrouded in darkness, its resources plundered, and its inhabitants subjected to unimaginable cruelty. This isn't dystopian fiction, but the grim reality of sea slavery, a hidden epidemic festering in the depths of the Indo-Pacific. Far from the idyllic imagery of sun-kissed beaches and turquoise waters, the vast expanse of this region conceals a disturbing truth. Forced labor and illegal fishing practices have become normalized, leaving a trail of human tragedy and environmental devastation in their wake. Countless individuals, lured by promises of opportunity, find themselves trapped in a cycle of abuse, robbed of their freedom and dignity. This pressing issue transcends mere human rights violations. It impacts global security by destabilizing communities, fueling organized crime, and even triggering regional tensions. Illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, the backbone of this nefarious industry, depletes ocean stocks, threatens food security, and undermines the livelihood of millions who depend on these resources. The ripples of this crisis touch us all. The, so the seafood we consume may unknowingly be tainted by blood and sweat. Unsustainable practices jeopardize our reliance on a healthy ocean for climate regulation and biodiversity. But amidst this darkness, a glimmering of hope remains. Today, we embark on a crucial mission to shed light on sea slavery, understand its complexities, and explore avenues for a brighter future. Annie and I will embark on this deep dive into this episode of the Security Nexus webinar. Annie, welcome to the Security Nexus webinar. Hi, James, thanks for having me. Oh, we're glad to have you here. I wonder if you might start off by telling us your story. Hmm. Well, my journey, mm. like many others, is full of twists and turns. But I think it's always been rooted in a deep connection to the ocean. How so? I mean, I love the ocean. I love the ocean as a little kid. You know, you drive to the, to the beach and the summer vacations with your parents and the smell of the seashore and it lights you up. I always loved water in general, whether it be pools or lakes, but there was just something sacred about oceans. And so I love the ocean. And naturally, when I went into my undergraduate studies at university, I studied oceanography. So from oceanography, I did a few different things. I ended up traveling a lot to Southeast Asia, working in hydrography, doing seafloor mapping. And then I also became a kite surfer. Okay, I've seen it. I've never experienced it. Do tell a little. Oh, James, you have to try it sometime. <laughs> it, takes, um, it takes a little bit to get used to it. You know, it's not just something that you can hop on and ride. It takes a little bit of training. But then once you can, oh, it's exhilarating. The feeling of freedom, mm. you, you know, the wind in your hair and just the water all around you and the sunshine on you. And it's just, it's a, it's a happy place. Did I read you were a commercial fisher? 
Yes, I was getting to that. Oh, tell me. Okay. So from oceanography to kite surfing, I also became a commercial fisherman in Alaska. Just in the summer times for the sockeye salmon runs. Mm. Um, but it was amazing. I mean, I didn't, when I was younger, I didn't want to eat fish because I loved the ocean so dearly. And as I got older and started becoming a commercial fisherman, I mean, I loved it. Mm. Something primal, something raw about harvesting your own food out of the sea. I mean, this is something I ended up enjoying harvesting my food from land as well later in life. But it was really in fishing that mm -hmm. I just I got so excited for it. And I love fishing. It's grueling hard work, but the reward was amazing. Anyway, so um, I've always had this calling to the sea. Well, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, I started working for a business intelligence firm in Switzerland. Okay. And I'm bringing this point up because it was a really impactful time hmm. um, where I, I made a certain realization. This business intel firm worked on collating, collecting environmental, social, and governance data, so ESG data, okay. for big banks and corporations that then use this information to uh, mitigate risk within their supply chains, do due diligence in their partners and who they work with. And this was in a whole new world for me, coming from a science background and an ocean background, working on business development and looking at risks, business risks, and learning how these different environmental and social and governance risks um, affected a business and business continuity. And through this work, I ended up becoming familiar with the harsh realities of labor abuses. Mm. And I should note that labor abuse really spans a spectrum, right? I mean, you have health and safety issues all the way to forced labor and modern day slavery. And I became connected to this issue. I, I knew that I wanted to be part of the solution addressing these kind of more humanitarian issues. Well, fast forward a couple more years and I moved home here to Honolulu and I started working with Surfrider Foundation where I co-led their ocean friendly restaurant program. And in this role, I spoke to local restaurants about how to source their seafood more responsibly. Well, color me shocked. <laughs> when I learned that forced labor was right here in my own backyard and in an industry I loved. All that time out in the world, I saw it in the Middle East. I saw it in Southeast Asia. I saw it in Africa. I knew it existed in America, specifically American agriculture. But I had never thought to consider it out on the ocean. Mm. And it being right here in my backyard. I mean, you might say it was a very coalescing moment in my life. I... um decided right then and there that I was going to dedicate my career to addressing this issue and combating forced labor on the seas. Your story reminded me of, not even to make a comparison, I can't do that, but uh, many months ago, maybe more than a year ago, a year and a half or so ago, I was listening to a, a podcast that uh, introduced me to sea slavery, mm. and I was appalled. I had not considered the life that uh, many were subjected to through trickery at times, mm. uh, and and so um, because of that, I've looked more, and I was excited to uh, have you here as a guest today. And so, thank you for coming and for sharing that about us, about you, and with uh, with the group. And uh, hmm. I have to thank you for highlighting this critical issue in this important series. It's nice to be able to come and speak about it and bring awareness to the topic. We use the term, and we will use it here, IUU fishing, and it's so sanitized almost when we say that. Mm. And I hope that's what we do. We can peel it back a little bit and realize that uh, behind, behind, behind what's become maybe a sanitized term, it's extremely ugly. Oh, yes. And so let us go off then and, and talk about the scope of sea slavery. So oceanic expanses shield the true magnitude of sea slavery in the fishing industry, where even uh, the 128,000 cases reported by the International Labor Organization suggests just the tip of an immense submerged crisis. So then here's a question for you. 
And could you share maybe a particular story or an instance of highlighting the impact of sea slavery on individuals and communities? Gosh, James, <laughs> there's so many. It's sad. Um, it's hard to pick just one. Oftentimes, fishers, hmm. migrant laborers, are lured into the promise of decent wages and stable work only to find themselves in this nightmarish reality of forced labor and abuse. They are forced to work long, grueling hours in hazardous conditions, um, oftentimes with little to no rest, at least not adequate rest, and oftentimes with little to no compensation. Uh, many endure physical, mental, and sometimes sexual abuse, deprivation of food, which nutritious food is important when you're doing such a hard, yeah. laborious job. So they, they have deprivation of food, um, clean water, basic health and safety measures. Uh, they are constricted on the vessels and not allowed to move. So... Think about this, you're a slave on land, you can still dream of escaping. You, you might try to escape. On the open ocean, where are you going to go? And these men are taken out on these vessels sometimes for years before they ever see land again. They're not speaking or communicating to their families during that time. They may not even have anybody on the vessel that speaks their language. So there's a certain amount of isolation that comes with that as well. Further, there are stories of men being coerced to take drugs, amphetamines, to enhance their performance. And sadly, there are stories of bodies being dumped overboard once the drugs and the physical abuse catch up with them. Who will come looking for them? They've already been missing from their communities for such a long amount of time. One particular story that, that does stick out in my mind mm. is the story of Sobriyanit. He was an Indonesian fisherman, and he did a stint in distant water fleets mm. um, that, that had been really profitable for him and his family. He came home, did whatever you do at home, and decided that he wanted to go back out on another fishing exploration to bring home more money for his family, to feed his family. I mean, really, that's what we're talking about. Just feeding your family, putting food on the plate. And so he registered with an Indonesian recruitment agency who found him a job with a Taiwanese longlining vessel. And he went off. And he was contracted at 30, 350 US dollars a month, which sounds not like much maybe to Western countries, but for these fishermen, it's a good opportunity. They know what they're getting into. They know it's hard work mm. and they want to bring that money home to feed their families. Yeah. So he agreed to $350 a month and off he went. And almost right away on the vessel, he found out that he was actually going to have a deduction of $100 a month from the company mm. until he finished his two-year contract. And that really was to deter the fishermen from running away, mm. right? I mean, maybe that vessel comes to land sometimes and they don't want to have their fishermen run away. So he already started getting $100 a month deducted. Well, they also mounted him with fees and fines in those first couple of months. So in the first two months of working, he only made a total of $100 US dollars, $700 down to one. Well, photographic and video evidence showed us later the amount of physical abuse he endured on the vessel um, at the hands of the captain, but also at the hands of his fellow crew who are ordered to do so by the captain. And even if they don't want to, they have to because they're scared of retribution. They're scared for their family safety on land. So he was beat for four months and tragically, um, sustained the types of injuries that ended his life mm. a mere four months after getting to that vessel. Those deductions from his wages for not finishing his contract, they never made it to his bank account. His family never saw those promised wages. 
And now he's unable to provide for his family or for the community. So you see, forced labor really doesn't affect only the individual experiencing the violence. It's a cycle and it impacts family and it introduces trauma to the communities. When your wages are withheld and your freedom is confined, you're unable to support your loved ones and you're unable to contribute to a developing economy of your community back home. Mm. There's no justice for fishers. No. There's no justice for the family. There's no justice for the community. And in the end, this cycle continues to wreak havoc on the poorest communities and the most vulnerable populations. Thank you for locating that to a personal level. It, uh, it, it uh, perhaps will help shape what we're talking about, the significance of what we're talking about today. So thank you for that. Yeah. I want to move the conversation and I want to talk about IUU fishing and global security. So IUU fishing casts a dark shadow on global security. It depletes vital fish stocks. It undermines coastal economies and it fuels crime, fostering regional instability and complex security challenges. So here's the question for you. How can we combat IUU fishing and ensure a secure, stable, and sustainable future for the oceans? What can we do? James, such a softball question. Gosh, that's not difficult at Uh all. Okay, well, I think as we dive into this space, and I'm going to give you a long answer here. There's a lot to touch on. Um, As we dive into this space, I think it's really important to understand that Illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, IUU, is an intersectional issue. And what does that mean? I mean, it it occurs at the intersection of environment, economic, and social well-being. It's a multifaceted issue uh, that touches upon many aspects of global security and cooperation. So let's look at one number to Mm. begin with. It's estimated that 23 billion U.S. dollars a year are stolen from the global economy. Mm. 23 billion. That undermines the economic viability of legal fisheries. Yes, of course. It also stirs up economic losses in developing countries, coastal states, um, and legitimate fishing communities. In the Indo-Pacific region, many of those countries get a large portion of their GDP from fish, from seafood. Um, So when we think about that number, I mean, in Southeast Asia alone, 200 million people are dependent on healthy fisheries for their livelihoods and their income. 200 million. If we don't have healthy fisheries, what are these people going to do? Where are they going to go? There are 200 million people that are dependent on a resource that we are losing. And so they still need to feed their families. They still need to put food on their plates. And this creates a situation where they are vulnerable and targets to transnational organized crime migration issues, other criminal activities, and all-out lawlessness. And I want to take a minute here to step back and be very specific about forced labor versus IUU. Because these are two different beings. Um, They're not necessarily the same thing, although they often get lumped together because they occur in the same operational space and are part of the same complex system that exploits resources and people. They're so much so that the US government has actually changed the legal definition of IUU to include forced labor. But it should be noted 
that that only affects U.S. enforcement and policies and is not a global uniform change. Mm. And so when we look at international laws and regulations that use IUU in their terminology, they do not include forced labor. They are separate issues with separate legal definitions that have separate laws and regulations, but operate in the same space. Okay. So that's the first thing to understand. Mm. And when we look at this complex system, and, and why is it complex? I mean, it's complex because there's many different parts to it, and these parts interact with each other and affect each other and impact each other. So what ends up happening in one area will lead to emerging problems that we maybe never experienced before in another area. It's a dynamic issue. So this kind of complex system becomes very difficult to, to approach. Um, let's see, it's, it's multidimensional. It um, manifests in a number of different ways. And it's difficult to chart because it has many actors with varying responsibilities and no ready-made solution. This makes it a transboundary crisis by definition. This operational space is multi-jurisdictional, multi-sectoral, transdisciplinary, inter-organizational, and probably a lot of other ping words that uh, yeah. you could go on and on about. But it is a very difficult space. So the question really becomes, how do we, yeah. as an international community, affect change in this transboundary crisis? We do. What can we do? Well, my research, um, my research shows that it requires an integrated deterrent approach. Okay. There are so many people working in this space. I, I was very lucky to be able to speak to numerous practitioners working on this issue from many different angles in, in their own individual silos, with their own disciplines, their own tools, their own perspectives. And what I can affirm from this is that we're missing opportunities. There are opportunities, but we need to talk to each other. We need to work together. We need person A, B, and C to know what person D, E, and F are working on, what tools they have. It amazed me sometimes how many people working in this space were unaware of some certain tools that didn't exist. Um, and it was true of almost every expert and every practitioner. When we think about what this looks like in reality, it is talking to each other. It is learning. It is collaborating. It is forming a strategic response. Each unique practitioner has a unique skill set. And that skill set, you could consider their superpower, mm -hmm. if you will. And in that, in that vein, every practitioner really is a superhero. Yeah. But if I could call on the Avengers team mm -hmm. from Marvel Comics, when they finally won, it was when their team came together. When every superhero came together and worked together, leveraging their superpowers in this strategic approach. Because I'm telling you, James, the Hulk, he can't do it alone. That's right. Yeah, no, there was... I had uh, your, your discussion about your realization about how there's a lot of people working, but they're not working together, is the experience I felt I had a long time ago First started working out and working in uh, government, I said, certainly we're all working together on a single. No, no, no. I was amazed at how duplicative or not even engaged or the effort it took to move another one. Uh, and so it is uh, disappointing, but probably not um, unexpected that we need to do so much collaborative work that you describe here. And so I, I, I think we should note that. It, if we're going to be better, we must come together. Uh, and, and these individual separate issues being worked will just, will 
probably chip at it, but not be near as effective as we could be. Yeah, I mean, there are definite gaps that we could sew up if we could be cohesive, mm. if we could be streamlined. And I'm not speaking just about military and yeah. defense and law enforcement, but I'm talking civil society organizations. Yeah. I'm talking um, the general public and NGOs, the private sector. Really, everyone, even consumers, everyone has a role to play if they can identify their superpower and how to utilize that. We can all we can all push the boat the same direction. I think mean, part of the problem is we perhaps just are unaware of why this issue should matter. And as we talk today, I think and I hope that the listeners will, if they haven't already, they'll take an approach. This issue is important and I ought to see where I can contribute along it as well. And I think we'll talk more about that as, as we go. I have some ideas. Oh, so good, good. Let's move this a little bit to uh, talk about the economic drivers. Mm. Money drives a lot of things, it's driving this issue as well, I'm sure. So to create solutions that disrupt the cycle of IUU fishing and sea slavery, we must understand how the fishing industry's pursuit of profit drives unsustainable practices. So Annie, can you discuss how to balance profitability and fishing industry with the long-term sustainability of ocean resources? With that balance there, can you, maybe? Maybe. I think it's no surprise that uh, profitability is indeed the central economic driver. Sure. Uh, one thing that's important to remember is a little bit different in this sector than I think other sectors is that the potential for high reward greatly outweighs the potential for risk. It's a lawless ocean out there and uh, risk is low. So that that's going to come into this balance equation. When we consider economic drivers, mm -hmm. we want to look at two levels, a micro level and a macro level. Let's start with the micro level. The micro level Think about daily operations. Well, how do you drive profitability in your daily operations? You cut costs. And so profitability really in this economic landscape of fisheries is intertwined between environmental and social exploitation to cut those costs. For example, let's think about fuel. Mm. Fuel, the price is always going up. You can't stop that. And um, when we combine that with the fact that overfishing and illegal fishing and climate change have all helped to deplete our fish stocks, we realize that fishing vessels are traveling farther distances for longer amounts of time, dealing with harsher conditions to get the same amount of fish that aren't bringing in the same price when they get back to land as it used to. Diminishing returns. And so where can they cut? costs, labor. On this same kind of thread, I mentioned those harsh conditions and the long periods at sea. Who wants to leave their family that long? It's really hard for these companies to keep trained, skilled workers, fishers in their labor pool. Mm. Uh, and so how do you fix that problem? You trick and coerce yeah. men to get on the boat, and you never bring them back to shore. Well, I was just going to say, so that, that kind of covers an, an example there in the micro space. On the macro level, you are thinking about profitability drivers in terms of sales opportunities, okay. market access. And in this space, we have a few different levers to use, right? Um, we can exert legal and compliance pressure. We can cut off market access through international trade agreements. And we can exert diplomatic pressure on companies to, uh, to incentivize them for ethical business reform. So... What does this look like in practice? 
Well, in 2014, the European Union threatened Thailand with the red card. They have a green, yellow, red card system. And Thailand received the yellow card. And they said, Thailand, if you don't clean up your act, we're not going to import your seafood to Europe anymore. We're going to give you the red card and not allow your seafood to enter our market. Well, that's pretty big incentive for Thailand to clean up their act. So they did a huge overhaul of their fisheries laws and policies in 2015, and they never received that red card. They were able to maintain their market access to the European Union. Another example I like to use is the United States mm. Customs and Border Patrol. I like to call them Captain America in my Avengers team, okay. since they are from the US. Fair enough. And their shield is what I would like to, to say is their withhold release orders. So they can issue withhold release orders for any product coming into the country that is thought to have come from forced labor. Hmm. What this does is it puts the import on hold while they la launch an investigation. And this has impact, right? Yeah. Time is money to these businesses. Right. Their, their product isn't moving. It is costing them tons of money in legal compliance fees. Lawyers are expensive. They're not making any money. And so it's a really big risk for them. And one of my favorite stories is when the CPB issued one of these withhold release orders and the Malaysian Securities Commission got wind of it. Mm. And once they got wind of it, they also stopped the import of seafood from this particular company. And so these international trade agreements and this diplomatic pressure, I mean, they are really a strong, powerful lever that needs to be utilized. And let's not forget how expensive lawyers and fines and fees are. All of that disrupts business continuity. And um, that's, really, that's really the magic sauce. Okay. Interrupting business continuity, creating financial disincentives for companies to behave unethically. No, I agree with you that uh, uh, commercial entities are constantly trying to uh, uh, increase their, their bottom line. Mm. And without regulations, without enforcement, uh, there's, uh, you know, it's an invitation to, uh, uh, to do less, perhaps to create more. And so. Well, I mean, and this brings up another really interesting point because we need to, to, to enforce these laws mm. and to investigate, we need to have better monitoring control and surveillance and enforcement on the open seas. That is going to take a large amount of investment. That is going to require our political leaders and decision makers to allocate resources so that we can build capacity and invest in the tools that we need. How are those political leaders going to get the political will to, to allocate resources to this issue when there's so many competing priorities on their plate? Well, the answer is we need the public, the general public, to, to make them, yeah. to, to define that political will. And then how did the general public know about this issue enough to, to raise the issue to that level? Well, this is where journalists, investigative journalists come in, NGOs, yes. trendsetters on social media, and other whistleblowers. I mean, it's really, it's really an all hands on deck approach that's needed. And, you know, this is an example where even journalists and the general public and trendsetters each become a superhero, each with a powerful superpower. And if, again, we can get everybody working together in a strategic approach, we might actually be able to make some waves here. Very spot on. I mean, you spoke about uh, state and non-state uh, oversight responsibilities. All have a responsibility to advance this effort, um, raise it to an attention level that uh, people with responsibilities to, um, to enforce, to manage, see this as an issue they must take on. Um, it has to be perceived as our problem, not just a problem over there, or somebody else's problem. Uh, and you, you've brought that uh, 
a few times to uh, to the attention of us. I, I think we'll stay in this uh, area. We'll, we'll loiter here a little bit, uh, and we'll talk more about policy and governance. And so, despite international agreements like the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS, or the Port State Measures Agreement, inadequate labor protection leaves fishers, especially vulnerable migrant workers, exposed to exploitation within the IUU fishing industry, still does. So Annie, how can we strengthen those policies? There are some that are there, but how do we strengthen them? You know, such policies and governance to protect our workers, to protect those workers, to ensure a truly sustainable fishing industry. What would you recommend? I'm glad you asked. Mm. Mm. So we have a lot of tools in our toolbox. Okay. But these measures, UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, and the Port State Measures Agreement, PSMA, as along with many others, yeah. are only as strong as they are adopted and implemented. That's right. So the first thing we need to do is really work on universal adoption and implementation of these and many other instruments. And what does that look like in practice? Mm. Well, let's take the Port State Measures Agreement for an example. Most countries in Southeast Asia have signed on to the Port State Measures Agreement. And how the PSMA works is it introduces port control measures in at port, meaning when a foreign flagged vessel comes into port to offload their fish, they can't offload their fish, they can't sell their fish, they can't have access to the market until an investigator goes on board and can verify that these fish were all caught legally and without the use of forced labor. And in theory, this sounds great because if all the ports are closed to the illegal fishers, they have no more job to do. They'll have to stop illegal fishing and get on board with legal policies and work within legal boundaries in order to make a profit, in order to sell their fish. Well, the problem mm. comes when you have a state like Malaysia that has not signed or ratified the Port State Measures Agreement. Now, all of a sudden, there's a loophole. Now, those practicing illegal fishing techniques can bring their fish into Malaysia and offload them there, mm. which really undermines the power of the PSMA as an international instrument. But let's not stop there. Mm. I'm going to talk about the United States. Okay. We, I would argue, we have a responsibility as a global leader yes. um, to work on maritime security issues and challenges. And yet, we have not become a party to UNCLOSE. Yeah. We've signed it. We operate under its framework. But we haven't ratified it. And I think it's something that definitely deserves a little bit of attention because if we're going to be true global leaders, we need to start with ourselves. And uniform adoption and implementation of these measures is necessary. One international instrument that you did not mention that mm. I'd like to take a second okay. and um, speak about is C-188. What's C-188? It's a convention, Convention 188. It's called the Work in Fishing Convention, and it comes from the International Labor Organization. Mm -hmm. So any um, real maritime nerds may not have gone down the International Labor Organization's list of conventions, but they have this great one, 188, that is specifically speaking to working in fishing. And there's only one country in Southeast Asia that has ratified it, mm. and that is Thailand. And of course, they did this as part of their major fisheries overhaul reform of 2015. I'd like to also note that even though Thailand did reform their fisheries laws and regulations, we still don't have any data or information about how that's impacted fishers' lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. So it's a step in the right direction, but I want to be careful not to say that it's a total fix. Yeah. Again, it's a whole of society approach and their government reformed their laws and regulations, but we really need to still learn what the impacts of this are. So there are these international instruments that we can tighten up on with uniform adoption and implementation. But there's another 
area we can look at. Mm. And those are creative intervention points. Okay. Some out of the box thinking. I'm going to mention two. One that I think would be a really interesting intervention point would be the requirement of pre-departure, sorry, pre-departure uh, briefings mm. on board vessels to fishermen given by labor union officials or fishery or representatives, um, but not government officials, specifically those that have the back of the fishers. Mm. And in those pre-departure briefings, they would speak about the fishermen's rights, what they what their rights are, uh, and they would also speak about red flags, warning signs, what abuse actually looks like. And that might sound crazy to you or to I. Of course, we know what abuse looks like. But in this industry, it, this industry has a culture of acceptance around this abuse. Yeah. And one of the most interesting things I learned in some of my research thus far is that the victims don't actually perceive themselves as victims. They think of it more of, this is just my life. Yeah. If and, I just worked a little harder, if I just did a little better, this would all go, it would, they'd stop this or they'd, things would be different or this, this industry's tough. I knew it when I started and therefore I need to buckle down. hundred yeah. percent. Or if they even do want to say anything, they don't think anyone cares about that, them. That's a real probability, actually, probably. I, I... So the reluctance of the victims to even see themselves as victims yeah. is something that I would include in the pre-departure briefings. Yeah. Another really interesting intervention point, potential intervention point, would be social media platforms. A lot of these fissures... Yeah receive ads through the Facebook algorithms, pushing these ads on them about what, um, about these employment opportunities. Well, what if we could work with the social media platforms and these algorithms? And so the, for every algorithm or every ad that they get pushed, they also get pushed information about how to identify the difference between a genuine employment opportunity versus red flags and warning signs of something that is going to end up being not so genuine. You know, wonder though, I, I think you're spot on. And yet, uh, when you're just, you know, earnestly seeking a job and there are not a lot of opportunities when one comes and it sounds so good, probably, uh, has uh, caught more than one person, uh, uh in a trap and, taking them off in the destruction. I mean, I've been there myself, not to obviously this level of labor exploitation, but you hear things, especially on social media platforms, you know, it's clickbait. You right. click on it. It sounds interesting. Good. It looks good. I want to do it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the role of multinational corporations in all of this. Uh, the murky path that seafood takes from the ocean to our plates I mean, it's shaped by corporate choices and it uh, raises sustainability and ethical concerns impacting, I mean, the, the ocean's health, the livelihoods, consumer options. And these are real issues that it impacts. So here's a question. As corporate choices cast a shadow over seafood industry, how can we navigate toward a future that prioritizes healthy oceans and ethical practices? Or can we? Can corporations be agents of change? Yeah. I mean, I believe they certainly can okay. be. The question is whether or not they decide to be. Mm. This requires incentivization. It does. Well, we've already talked about ways that we can do that, mm. right? We can we can make it financially unten untenable to operate below the border of ethical pra practices. Mm. So... Just to kind of reflect on my earlier answer, we really need to drive home monitoring enforcement and increase the risk for that bad behavior would bring to them and create this financial dis disincentive, yeah. interrupt business continuity until the risk is no longer worth it for them. Mm. But then the real question is, how do they become agents of change? Say they genuinely want to become agents of change. How do they do this? 
they have to really look at themselves and take um take a genuine interest. I, I've said that phrase a couple of times, but I guess it's just because it has to really be authentic. They have to prioritize environmental and social responsibility. They have to look at their supply chains and be transparent about that to themselves and to their consumers. And they have to be accountable for their own actions in their past. They have to directly engage with fishers, the, the men that are out there doing the work. And I keep saying men because on the high seas and in international waters and distant water fleets, it, it is often men, adult teenagers mm -hmm. and young men. But fish workers also involve women and children in processing plants on land, aquaculture. Yep. So please don't be distracted by me talking about men. Um, I digress. The point was they have to engage in genuine conversations with these fish workers mm. in all of these locations. How do these corporations know what these fishers need unless they talk to them? Yeah. And so how do they do that? Mm. Um, the best is to engage with labor unions, fishery labor unions, engage with where unions aren't allowed, fishery organization representative groups. They need to allow coalitions to be formed so that collective bargaining agreements can be had. And this is not a one-time meet annually between the executives and the fishers. This is an iterative process and it takes collaboration and it takes prioritization and it takes revisiting it over and over again and always putting the fishers well-being first. Because the truth is, James, when we talk about fishers being stakeholders, I mean, that's true. But fish workers are rights holders. That's right. They have rights. And we need to look at seeing them as rights holders more and as stakeholders less. Well said. Let's talk about technological solutions. The technological revolution of satellites, AI, and blockchain offers powerful tools against illegal fishing. Of course, with the hope of, you know, exposing IUU operations and doing something about it. So can you elaborate on the significant obstacles that remain using this uh, technology, this technology efficiently and, and then what we can work toward to overcome this? Yeah, I'll leave it there. Sure. I'm no technology expert, um, but you don't have to be a technology expert to understand the biggest roadblocks. Mm. They're often foundational. Lack of funding and resources is a big one. There isn't enough funding and resources available to employ advanced technologies, but also basic technologies. In particular, internet connectivity mm. is a huge one. Yeah. Coastal communities and law enforcement vessels don't have stable internet, so they can't look at information in real time. They can't upload information. They can't download information. They can't work and collaborate across areas. Um, besides internet, stable internet connectivity, they also need digital databases. Many nations still rely on the old school paper filing mechanism. This is not going, if you're an island archipelago of 250 islands, how are you going to get that piece of paper from one island to the next in real time? Enough for it to be effective. Right. So we need digital databases. Mm. So we need basic infrastructure like this internet connectivity and digital databases. But another roadblock really is information sharing between neighboring nations. Yeah. Boats move. Yeah. You can chase that boat only so far, but then your neighbor has to be able to pick it up. The scenes of where... They yeah. operate. Yeah. And so this this digital database needs to also be on a standardized platform that is accessible to all nations. And we need to work on international cooperation agreements that will allow information sharing between nations so that they can collaborate. I mean, blockchain is great, hmm. right? It'll it'll trace your seafood from where it's fished to the plate it ends up on. That's right. But without laws and regulations regarding data sovereignty and uh, privacy concerns, these nations aren't going to want to share this information. They can't make use of this technology. 
So we really have to start really on the foundational level. And then we also have to remember that technology is evolving so quickly it is. and is so complex yeah. that we really need to work on building capacity in these coastal communities, yeah. as well as within law enforcement to be more literate in terms of digital technology. Well said. Let's kind of wrap this uh, almost where we started. Uh, in earlier comments you made anyhow about the community impact. So the Indo-Pacific Ocean I mean, is traditionally a source of life and identity for communities, but now it suffers from IUU fishing and sea slavery, and it leaves them with empty nets, with hunger and shattered traditions, and it creates a devastating human crisis. So how can we empower communities to be stewards of their resources, creating sustainable alternatives and maybe breaking this devastating cycle. Oh, I'm glad you asked. Mm. Um, local local community empowerment is paramount it to is. this fight. Here in Hawaii, we have the Department of Land and Natural Resources, and they actually have an app where you can leave an anonymous tip. If you see anything, hear anything, you can leave an anonymous tip, and they'll go check it out. Okay. In the Philippines, they have this program called Bantai Dagat, which empowers local communities to be the eyes and ears and enforcement on the water to look for illegal fishers. My favorite story is of a community deep, deep in the Sulu archipelago. They've actually rebranded it and they call it Jaga de Lao, which roughly translates to guardians of the sea in their local language. And they've been very successful in making apprehensions mm. of illegal fishers. The fishermen themselves are becoming the enforcement agencies. Mm -hmm. So besides protecting their resource and empowering them, they're also learning the laws around fisheries, why those are laws. And they're able to be stewards of their own area and they're able to have power. And this is critical if we want them to feel empowered, if we want them to raise their voice and to be yes. proud to raise their voice. Thank you. This is, this is going to be the last uh, question I want to ask before we move on to uh, uh, some Q&A. And that's about the future, future direction where this goes. And so we've highlighted the potential of technology, collaborative governance, shift into market dynamics. So if we're going to combine these efforts, can we envision a future where sustainable fisheries, ethic, ethical labor practices, and a thriving ocean are the global norm? Gosh, I hope so. Uh -huh, me too. <laughs> um, I think it's absolutely possible. Okay. I mean, maybe I'm a glass is half full kind of person, but it is absolutely feasible to think of this. Um, so we need investigative journalists like Ian Arbina mm -hmm. and Martha Mendoza to continue bringing awareness to this topic. They have really advanced this issue in in so many ways. We need trendsetters. We need NGOs to continue raising awareness. We need academics to do research that's helpful at every part of this cycle to empower the practitioners to do their work. We need sustainable and business consultants to help businesses navigate business reform. We need international lawyers like Marika McAdam to help form policy, but to also bring together governing officials in organizations like the Bali process, um, to talk to each other, to be in working towards each other. We need to also empower law enforcement and military and defense with the monitoring, control, and surveillance and enforcement equipment that they need yeah. to do their job better. It really is a whole of society approach, yeah. and we really need everyone there, bringing their superpower to the table, talking amongst themselves, working towards the same goal with their superpower so that we fill those gaps, tighten up, and see a change. A lot of those resources you spoke about, you had shared with me earlier. We're going to put them in the show notes so that uh, guests can uh, pull some from there. Oh, good. Yeah. So as, as we go ahead and uh, bring this to a close, I do want to switch to a, uh, to a discussion about a few of the uh, audience questions. And so we've kind of curated a diverse selection, and I'll hit a couple of these in our last few minutes. Let's start with the first one on human trafficking and transnational crime. So here's the question. Could you discuss the relationship between human trafficking, 
transnational crime and illegal fishing. And I'll, this will be a lightning round. So these can be, these can go quick. <clears throat> okay. I'll try and go fast. Uh, it's a big topic. Mm. So <clears throat> if you're engaged in illegal fishing, you are not paying your workers. You are probably involved in some kind of document forgery, tax evasion, other white collar crimes. You're laundering money. Um, and when you're involved in so many different crimes and you yeah. need so many different people to work with, this starts to build a network of organized crime. And it does go internationally. And so we call it transnational organized crime. And illegal fishing does provide a covert kind of opaque area in which to traffic humans from it. We spoke earlier briefly about labor voice abuse and exploitation having a large spectrum. Mm. And we talked about forced labor and modern day slavery being more part of the egregious part of the spectrum. But it's also some of that cons cons constitutes human trafficking. Yes. The opaque operations of fishing vessels traveling between borders with almost impunity also creates a great way to traffic humans that aren't working on the boat, but that you would use for other things. Right. And also trafficking drugs, small arms. All of this is helping other transnational organized crime networks and terrorist operations. Yeah, the same networks are trafficking all these different transnational crimes. They're, they're, they're not separate networks, are they? They're, they're going... That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about uh, forced labor identification and uh, the prevalence. So what is the... And you touched about this, I touched on this a little bit, but what is the prevalence of forced labor within the United States and how is it identified? You know, I really couldn't be sure. I couldn't answer this um, because it's, it's very difficult to measure. And forced labor has a few different definitions depending on who you ask. I mean, even here in Hawaii, if you ask, some people will say that the men on the Hawaii longlining fleets are victims of forced labor. And other people will tell you that they are very happy for their employment opportunity and to send that money home, even if they're not allowed to get off the vessel when they come to land here. So they have restricted movement. And that is, you know, one of those that is one of the elements in those different definitions. So forced labor is very difficult to quantify for this reason, but it's also hit it happening in this very hidden, murky space. So it's really hard to answer that question. I will tell you, I was I've, I've read uh, some books on uh, forced labor in the United States. It's uh, shocking and appalling, and you would not think it is happening in our own borders. And that would be a Pollyannish uh, uh, approach to thinking about it. It is real. And so quantifying it, on the other hand, uh, like you said, that could be very difficult to do, but it does exist, right? I mean, at least within the sector of agriculture, you can walk onto the farms. That's right. You can't walk onto these vessels. Many of them never even come back to shore. Fair. S Regional security and maritime governance. Is regional collaboration then the key to resolving specific maritime security challenges rather than a global approach? I love this question. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not an it's not an or. No, no, life never almost is. You got to chew and chew gum and walk at the same time. Yeah, that's right. Um yeah, so we talked about technology earlier and I talked about digital information mm -hmm. databases. Right now, the UNFAO is putting together a global global exchange information system, GEIS. And when I speak about regionally and us having these data information sharing databases, there's also um, such a concept being built in Southeast Asia. What we need to make sure that we do, because it's not either or, it's definitely an end. We need to make sure that as we are developing these standardized platforms, that we're doing it in a streamlined way such that the already thinly stretched research resource scarce agencies doing the good work and inputting the data and inputting the information, we need to streamline it so that they're not inputting it twice. So they're not having to put it into the global database and the regional one. Yeah. We need to have the IT guys talk to each other and make it one language so that the enforcement agents that are already scrapped for time and resources can just input it once and it would go to both. No, you're spot on. You know, before we say goodbye, what book would you recommend to our audience who wants to delve deeper into these critical ocean issues? Oh, hands down. One of my favorites, Outlaw Ocean. And who's the author? Ian Urbina. 
He is an investigative journalist, Pulitzer Prize winning. He spent years, if not decades, traveling on the open seas, documenting instances of criminal activity, human exploitation, environmental degradation. He touches on regulatory gaps. He speaks a lot about where where there are issues and what can be sewn up. It's a it's a fascinating read. It's super I think it's super easy to get through because it's so fascinating, but it's definitely written for the layman, not for the academic. We'll add that book to our uh, recommendation list. Annie, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, James. So that wraps up our insightful discussion with Annie. Her wisdom and dedication inspires us to build a better future for our oceans. Mahalo nui loa, Annie. Are you curious about another fascinating corner of the world? Join us tomorrow as we journey to North Korea with renowned expert Glenn Ford, who's visited the country nearly 50 times. We'll delve into the complex political landscape, uncover recent developments, and explore potential solutions for a brighter future. This promises to be a compelling conversation. Don't miss it. Register now. Aloha oi. And until next time, this is James Minnick signing off. As always, the opinions expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of DKI APCSS, the U.S. Department of Defense, or the U.S. government.